however, having technical problems, feel free to contact the host via the chat room and Stephen Wren will help you out. This allows us to focus our attention on the experiences we will have together without distraction. Our congregation is committed to individual freedom of belief, welcomes diversity, seeks to promote a sense of community and fosters religion, which enriches the spirit. Whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived here, you are welcome. Kim? I was waiting for the visual, but here we go. Clearing by Martha Pottlewaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you realize and recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. On the doorstep of 2021, leaving 2020 behind, we rest in transition. At the threshold of a new year, we find ourselves in a space in between with an opportunity to pause, reflect, and consider this fruitful time. We've known these transitions in our lives, between graduation and college, between divorce and remarriage, coming out of sleep, yet not fully awake. Life offers numerous transitions and thresholds, which often go unacknowledged yet have great meaning. Today, the Transforming Mystery and Wonder team will take you to new and old thresholds, inviting you to savor the openness, the unknown, and the possibilities you might encounter. To prepare our hearts for this service, and the space in between, I invite you to now just take a moment of reflection as Beth just articulated by finding your feet on the floor, your sit bones on your seat, your spine tall and dignified. Please close your eyes. Bring your awareness inside your body to your heart. You are uniquely human. You are in transition. You are held by the love of this community. Whatever emotions you feel in your heart, or sensations you feel in your body are all part of what you bring on this day and into the new year. So as a community, let's take three deep breaths into what is fully present right now. Inhaling to expand your belly, your lungs, and your heart. Exhaling to release, let go, and give yourself to this world so worth of rescue. Two more wide, full breaths. 
feeling this physicality of breathing in a fresh new air from the universe, letting it go fully into this restful space as you exhale. One more on your own. And then whenever you're comfortable and ready, gently open your eyes again. Thank you. As a caring community, we set aside time for joys and concerns of our members and our friends, honoring the humanity and sacred spirit within each of us. We support each other in difficult times and we celebrate our joys together. If you have a joy you'd like to share or a burden that might be eased by sharing it in community, you are invited to share it in community. Do you want to introduce the song? Oh, the song. <laughs> Please. We're going to read, uh, we're going to sing There is a Love, and uh, we're all going to be muted, and the words are on the screen. I will now read a poem by Anne Hillman. We look with uncertainty. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born in us if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. Have you ever felt uncomfortable in certain periods of your life, between jobs, home in bed sick for weeks, or standing at an, in an elevator alone at night, have you noticed that moment between when you are truly awake, yet still in a sleep state, hovering between sleep and wakefulness? Do you remember the time after graduation, before the next step in your life, and how slightly awkward that was? 
Do you wonder what life will be like without COVID? Today, we would like to explore the spaces in between, times or experiences of transition, personally and globally. Some call these thresholds. For many, they are deeply valuable. Yet for others, they are incredibly difficult. Staying in the unknown, embracing uncertainty is not easy for many of us. I am speaking of liminality, inviting a stillness to notice the present moment without judgment, with an open mind. In fact, liminality is barely perceptible and has the quality of ambiguity or disorientation. We have been in it, waiting for the final results of the presidential election. I, for one, was highly anxious, very uncomfortable, with the unknown, living in liminality. I confess to still being uncertain and unknown about what may take place between now and the inauguration. So here we are on the last Sunday of 2020, a year of the global pandemic with hundreds of thousands of lives lost and all of us directly impacted by the necessity to isolate, mask up, stay away from our friends and family for months and question whether or not we have enough, have enough money for rent or groceries. We all want 2020 to end, but what will 2021 look and feel like? I have my hopes and wishes, but I certainly do not know and cannot predict how the coming year will evolve. Richard Rohr says, this global pandemic we now face is an example of an immense collective liminal space. This in-between place is free of illusions and false payoffs. It invites us to discover and live from broader perspectives and with much deeper seeing. We are in between on a threshold living in and with uncertainty. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold, any point or place of entering or beginning. A liminal space is the time between the what was and the next. It is a place of transition, a season of waiting and not knowing. It is a threshold state where what we know becomes questionable. It lies on the boundary between the known and the unknown with either being possible. Sometimes liminal space can be huge and deep or it can be as Beth has said, barely perceptible, fleeting. I experienced the hugeness of liminality most deeply in my mid twenties. I had been married right out of college. The person I had dated since ninth grade is the person I married. As you can imagine, I had kind of grown up with Dave, limiting my explorations in relationships and even in myself. When Dave fell in love with a fellow law student and we divorced after five years of marriage, I was thrown into a huge, deep liminal state <laughs> that I would say lasted three years. Through the, though the dimensions of it changed as I quite literally pulled myself up from inside of me and shaped myself into who I was alone as a fully formed individual, myself. Sometimes it's these kinds of liminal experiences that we remember the most, the transformational ones that Roar refers to, that lead to a deeper seeing and a broader perspective. But I want to talk also about liminality that we experience every single day, the brief in-betweenness that we can feel that is barely perceptible 
that moment when we see Mount Rainier when we're driving, the early evening sky, when we look at a piece of art, when we listen to a piece of music, or see the images that we are using in this service today. In these moments, we're suspended in liminality. We are in a moment of permeability, of aliveness. In these moments, some kind of shift occurs. This can also be an everyday way of thinking. In fact, there's a whole body of people and a whole body of thought about what is called liminal thinking. Dave Gray is one of these people who is an author of a book about this kind of thinking. He advises us to hold our theories loosely. So I'm gonna repeat that. He advises us to hold our theories loosely, to empty our cups and to take on an attitude of openness, of curiosity, of eagerness to learn and willingness to be vulnerable. I aspire to this, to find these everyday moments of liminality, a conversation with someone, an encounter with a person you don't even know in the parking lot, a view of the sunset through the trees, or a bird song. So let's also try, as Gray advises, to hold our theories loosely and to be open to those moments of permeability and aliveness. Let's linger there. Thanks, Donna. In Karen Dickel's words, liminal space, we are experiencing one right now. It is also at the heart of the natural environment that we live in every day, as Donna has just described. This is why being in nature feels so good. We get to immerse ourselves in the constant cycle of transformation and growth. Liminal space mostly requires one thing above all else, and that is to just be. When in liminal space, you are suspended in the twilight of a dying existence, and an emerging one. Take a minute to think over the last few weeks. How many times have you had to confront deep fear, boredom, restlessness, or vulnerability? Conversely, how often have you felt deep rest, profound generosity, creativity, or uncontrolled imagination? When is the last time you got to experience being fully human like this? This is the power of liminal space. It's not easy, but it is essential and none of us gets to escape it. At some point or many points in our lives, we pass into these experiences and they change us forever. If you choose to move into and surrender to liminal space, you recognize that transformation is constant and you get accustomed even crave to living in an unmoored world. After 27 years of building <clears throat> the marriage, a family, a home, and uh, working nose to the grindstone towards happily ever after, uh, my life disintegrated in divorce. It was a difficult and necessary change in my life. My old life had ended and I set out to start a new one. I'm a doer, not a stewer. That's what my friend Susie says. So I didn't look back and I just forged ahead. During that time, I read a book by William Bridges, which I think is great because his book is called Transitions, Making Sense of Life's Changes. And he said, life will change is situational, it's external. And transition, on the other hand, is psychological or internal. So it's not those events, but rather the inner reorientation and self redefinition that you have to go through in order to incorporate any of those changes into your life. Without transition, change is just rearrangement of the furniture. And unless transition happens, the change won't work because it doesn't take. 
At the time, I didn't really understand how important that space in between an ending and a beginning was. That uncomfortable, scary, chaotic, uncertain, isolating, treading water to keep afloat place. And I just wanted to skip over it. And I did by self-medicating with busyness and work and projects during the day and with lots of wine at night. So my story is kind of an example of how not to do liminal space, that space in between. So I'm learning to use that space in between, to be still, to grieve, to dream, to break open, to feel joy, to be uncomfortable, and then just wait, to wait. And I'm learning to honor that space and rest in that space. I'm also learning how to be a human being instead of just a human doing. And I also learned <clears throat> that I have a real blind spot and that was learning to ask for support from friends and from family and from beloved community. Honoring that space in between can be sort of a spiritual practice. And Pema Chodron says, sticking with uncertainty is how we learn to relax in the midst of chaos. How we learn to be cool when the ground beneath us suddenly disappears. We can bring ourselves back to the spiritual path countless times every day simply by exercising our willingness to rest in the uncertainty of the present moment over and over again. She says, what if rather than being disheartened by ambiguity and the uncertainty of life, we accepted it and relaxed into it? After all, change is the only constant in life, right? Thanks for listening. Continue with Karen Dickel, who talks about liminal time. We may start to see things in our environment that have gone previously unnoticed. Something as benign as a bird call or an empty baseball field start to hold significance and may even open us up to a deep part in our psyche. I have stopped marking time by weeks, days, and even hours. I am recalling the time that is passing by recalling the experiences of this time. As such, the beginning of the experience wasn't a date on the calendar. It was the first awareness I had that I had stepped into a liminal space. It was when I realized that everyone on the planet was engaged in a common experience. I was part of a greater whole. I was not alone. This may be the most powerful aspect of liminal time and space, its commonality, its humanness. Experiencing liminal space in a pandemic is unique in that it brings this commonality to the forefront and reminds us of the connection inherent in transformation. Thank you, Beth. The beginning of the experience wasn't a date on the calendar. It was the first awareness that I had stepped into liminal space. Those words by Karen Dickel resonate with me. As a 16 year old, my awareness of liminal space happened as I was chosen to go on a trip to Europe. Many thresholds were approached and many were crossed. I didn't know the word liminal then, but I know the experience of it now. Young Life Tacoma was organizing a group of high school students to deliver 10,000 American dollars and New Testaments written in Russian to believers in the Iron Curtain countries. The underground church of the Soviet Union based in San Francisco was sponsoring us. Globally, the US and the Soviet Union were locked in the Cold War. Nonetheless, by faith and fortitude, a five week trip was planned prayed about and finally embarked on. 10 months before the departure date, I excitedly told my favorite teacher at Wilson High School about my 
planned travels abroad. Mr. H was appalled. He brought in books and articles that he wanted me to read. He brought me folders of newspaper clippings and mimeograph maps outlining Soviet incursions. His open, friendly demeanor became more troubled as years passed. The pile of manila envelopes I had to take home on Fridays increased, but I forged on. Passports and visas were applied for, VW vans were rented in Brussels, and rail passes were purchased. Nothing could dampen my spirit. In the spring of 1973, Mr. H felt compelled to convince my parents that giving their consent, allowing me to go on this mission was not just foolhardy, but it was dangerous. He wrote them a letter, which I dutifully delivered. His letter told of the historical horrors that lurked behind the Iron Curtain. He wrote about the overly powerful oligarchy, the oppressed working class, the unabashed racism and the prestigiously appointed political leaders who were nothing more than weapons dealers and armament promoters. His concerns caused my parents to sit for weeks at the kitchen table while my father nursed his scotch and soda and coddled fear. I had to sit with them and I had to just listen. I was caught in the liminal space between the most influential men in my life, my father, my favorite teacher, and Jesus. I was caught not knowing if I should trust my faith or the wisdom of my teacher. I was left wondering if I would spend another summer in the lifeguard chair or if I was going to, get to go behind the Iron Curtain. I was stuck. Was I going to trust my higher power and that it would protect me? Or was I going to get to peek firsthand behind said curtain? Or would I just stick to the pool decks and sidewalks that I already knew that summer? On the one hand, I had a trusted teacher, more knowledgeable certainly than my parents about the nature of communism, who adamantly opposed the trip. On the other hand, was the unknown journey that might be fraught with danger and peril but would be done in support of God's people oppressed by communist regimes. I was straddling a threshold of faith, freedom, and teenage angst. Still unsure of what the right choice was, I boarded a plane along with 17 others from SeaTac that was Europe bound. There were many experiences from the journey that rise for me, but the biggest threshold I crossed which was my first journey into true liminal space, was one where I came to trust the entirety of my being and my higher power. There was a moment when I realized that everyone on the planet is engaged in a common experience. Here is how it transpired. We had been traveling for 10 sweaty days in Volkswagen vans. We were tired of driving and tired of cities. We arrived at a student camp in the countryside somewhere in Czechoslovakia. It was a late July afternoon. The natural beauty of the place uplifted us. The light was filtered through lush beech trees which lined a large soccer pitch in the midst of a young pioneers camp. The campers were aspiring young communists from Eastern Europe. They played an exhibition soccer match for our benefit. The match had just ended. The 18 of us Washingtonian young lifers walked in onto the freshly mown grass to shake those players' hands. Quickly, we were singled out and we were surrounded by faces much like ourselves. It was like Pentecost. There were many tongues charged by the fires of curiosity. Questions were posed to us about the West. Did I live in a big house? Did I go to Motown a lot? Could I travel anywhere I wanted? Did I have any jeans I would like to sell? Was I going to a trade school or university? How long would I have to be conscripted in the military? Before I could finish answering a question, what I said was translated from my rudimentary German into Polish, Czech, Finnish, and Russian. There was much laughter, gleaming smiles, and bright eyes. But there was also 
consternation from the young pioneers about the terrorist attacks that had occurred at the Olympics in Munich in 1972. They hadn't heard about that. They did not know that Martin Luther King or Bobby Kennedy, whom they dearly loved, were dead. They hadn't heard about that either. And they were shocked to know that I didn't know where Motown was. As the sun set that afternoon, I became part of a greater whole. I was not alone, nor was I frightened of these teenagers much like myself. I was surrounded by life and hopes and dreams and people whose experiences thus far were not so very different from mine. People I'd been told to fear, and yet what became a blazingly apparent to me was the most powerful aspect of that moment was our shared commonality and our shared humanness. Humanness that loves music. Humanness that wants to choose one's own destiny. Humanness that seeks knowledge. Despite all the projected and promoted horrors hidden behind the Iron Curtain, I experienced global citizens who wanted individual freedom, a free press, educational choice, good music, and peace. That lesson has allowed me to cross over many times. When I allow myself to see beyond the limitations of media, Mr. H, or my own biased fears, I experience humanity and it is good. Thank you. Ishamaya Gonzalez says, I have been known to gather moss in liminal space and it is community that has saved me. Community serves as a mirror to see my weaknesses in the reflection of another, but also to shine light on my strengths. In community, I learn how to lean on another for support knowing there will be a time when I will provide the shoulder to cry on or the arm to lean upon. In community, I see who I was created to be and I rest, gathering strength for the transition to come. This is the crux of liminal space as we can only come into fullness as humans in community when we realize we are not alone. As we head into small groups, prepare to be a generous listener. Seek to understand the humanity behind one another's words and be as present in the moment as possible. 
listen and speak with your heart. Our blessed community has experienced liminality this year as we transitioned from being together in person to being on Zoom. This is our collective experience of liminal space. And this is not the first time any of us has experienced a threshold or transition in our lives. Now in your small group, you were invited to share times in your life when you, ha when you have experienced a threshold or transition. Uh, Stephen will... We're moving into our offertory. Our love calls us to act for peace, social and economic justice, freedom of belief, and protection of our entire beloved planet and its inhabitants. As individuals and as a congregation, we engage in worthy local and global causes. We stay informed on issues of our time and through each step, we persevere, our spirits renewed by our involvement. By our actions, we hope to inspire others to join us in this work. One Sunday a month, we use 100% of our collection for a nonprofit of our choice. The other Sundays, the collection adds to the vibrancy of our fellowship. Today's offering supports the Vashon Youth and Family Services Program Vashon Kids, which has been in operation since 1995. I'm the president of our Vashon Rotary Club, and we did a very successful, gratefully, <laughs> virtual um, online fundraiser for Vashon Kids and all of Vashon Youth and Family Services programs on December 21st called Home to Vashon. And I visited Vashon Kids at Chautauqua School. So our offering will go towards this program. It provides dependable, creative, and convenient before and after school care for five to 12 year olds. Since 1995, they've provided creative programming delivered by experienced staff that encourages children's unique spirit to thrive. They promote healthy play, accept differences, seek to resolve conflicts very peacefully, while supporting each other child's dignity. During this school year with the pandemic and COVID, they have designated homework time with staff to assist children with their questions. And they have academic and enrichment activities and clubs focus on science, art, the humanities, literacy and sports. And you can look up more about that by just visiting vashonyouthandfamilyservices.org slash vashon hyphen kids. So um, Stephen, can you show the image of our offertory, please?
Thank you, Stephen. We'll move into singing together. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. At home, full volume if you want. The following poem is by Polly Castor, titled Liminal Space. In this waiting space, we loiter, hover on a tentative cusp, a threshold between the familiar and the unknown with no possible retreat. The customary comfort zone is gone and where the entrance ushers is not yet seen. Our new question, let alone its answer, still is ambiguous. We are in limbo. We can either hesitate or go forward. The gossamer veil of divine nearness flutters ever so lightly, breathing inseparably close as we step to embrace the unrevealed with trust, a shimmering opportunity for connection and listening and being led right on through. Lean into this portal. It is the doorstep to fruitful ground. Now that the formal part of our service is over, we'll continue with announcements. Does anyone have an announcement?
Stephen, do you want to call people? Pamela looks like she's got one. Yep. Pam, you're up. Yes. Um, the uh, book club is going to be meeting on January 24th, and our book is The Book of Joy by the Dalai Lama Desmond Tutu with Douglas Abrams. That book has already been chosen and will be our book club. But in the uh, newsletter, <laughs> I made a mistake and uh, it acted like we were still having to choose the book. But this is the book for January 24th. But I would like your suggestions for what book to use for February so we have time to be able to get a hold of the books and read them. And uh, there were some suggestions sent out in the newsletter that had some Unitarian uh, books from Beacon Press for people to look at as well as some of the books we had on the list for last time to consider. So if you would let me know um, by like the end of the first week in January, what book you'd like to have for the February book club meeting, which will be on the fourth Sunday, which would be February 28th. But January is the book of joy. And I started reading it and it has some really nice things in it. So I hope you really enjoy it. Hello, everyone. I wanted to announce next week's service, and it dovetails really nicely onto today's service. Thank you very much for the liminal service, everyone. It was beautiful. Uh, it will be a mixture of times where we can take part in it and times where there's just listening and you, the wash of the blessings from the famous poet, philosopher, Irish poet philosopher John O'Donohue will be the words that we listen to. So I'd like to ask everybody to, I'm so excited about it, I'd like to ask you to prepare to have three things with you and we'll put it, I will put it in the newsletter too, but to have a bowl of water that you'll be able to put your hand in, to have a rock from the garden or a piece of wood, something out in your yard from nature that you can touch. And the third will be to have a candle. So um, your chalice will be fine. So those are the three things. And it will be a continuation of this, looking forward and how do we move forward? Thank you. Uh, hi, um, I just wanted to remind you, as if you didn't already know it, that this is coming to the end of the calendar year, and anybody who would uh, like to support um, PIUF has a chance to submit a, a check or a pledge this week. Um, just for ease sake, the, it's uh, post office box 1127 if you want to just send something in to Kirk, but um, our community always appreciates your support, whether it's a pledge payment or just an additional offering uh, that you want to make, we would be appreciative. Anyone else? Uh. Lauren, go ahead. Thanks, Stephen. So Jessica West is not here today, so I'm going to step in and do um, a reminder of our upcoming second of second Wednesday of the month of January. We will have our so-called women's group, and um, all members and friends and visitors and guests. I'm noticing some new faces here, so. For anyone, um, this this meeting, this gather, gathering is open and welcoming of all members and friends and visitors who feel they of uh, all women women identified friends and members. So, if you would like to add your name to the email invitation list, you can um, email you can email me. I'll give you my email address. I don't I. Please hold this in confidence. I don't really like to give out my conf confidential contact information, but um, I'll trust that you will not. This is the crux of liminal space. 
as we can only come into fullness as humans in community when we realize we are not alone. And this ends our service. Chat room is open. Glad you could all make it. <laughs>